Dino Riders is a 14-episode 80s cartoon show revolved around a group of human-like aliens called the Valorians, who are at war with the Rulons, another group of aliens made up of multiple species with snake, shark, and insect-like features. As the Valorians attempt to escape the Rulons, they accidentally travel back in time and crash land on a prehistoric Earth, where the battle continues between the two alien species. With nowhere else to go, the Valorians use their telepathic abilities to communicate with and befriend the dinosaurs to help them fight against the Rulons, while the Rulons use their brain boxes to control the dinosaurs against their will to build a prehistoric army to fight against the Valorians. Sounds like a pretty cool concept, and one that many people have suggested for me to cover a lot over the last couple of years. But looking more into it, I realize that, like most of the stuff that I cover, the story behind the topic goes a lot deeper than you might initially anticipate. That being said, it should be no surprise to most most of you that Dino Riders didn't actually start off as a TV show, but rather a toy line by Tyco Toys. While on surface level, these may just seem like normal dinosaur toys, you know, just random pieces of plastic to the general audience that checkmarked all of the boxes on the list of what makes a standard toy set to grab the attention of an 8-year-old kid. Dinosaurs, alien action figures, armor, weapons, cool sound effects, it has everything. But it's also those exact elements that made this toy line so unique and would go on to not only spawn a couple of adaptations in the form of a TV show and a short comic series, but the Dino Riders toy line would also grab the attention of many big names in the toy industry and even bleed into the world of paleontology. This toy line was a big deal back in the day because it wasn't just what Tycho was attempting to create, but it was also how they went about creating it. The story of Dino Riders, believe it or not, is actually a bit of a long one with many names involved, but I quickly became invested into it while researching it for this video, as I usually do when I cover these kinds of topics. So I really want to take some time today to really go into the story behind what led to the Dino Riders toy line, TV show, and comic book adaptation. Before I get started though, I really want to give a huge shout out to the Dino Riders World website, which is an unofficial fan-made website made by a Dino Riders superfan who's collected pretty much anything and everything related to Dino Riders and compiled it onto this site, which is where I got a lot of my information, material, and sources from that will be seen and mentioned in this video. Seriously, this website has everything, images of early prototypes from the toy line, excerpts from pretty much every article, book, and magazine Dino Riders has ever been mentioned in, a list of all the merchandise that was ever made for Dino Riders, and so much more. This site was a massive help when it came to the research, and obviously I wasn't able to include everything from it, but if you're interested in Dino Riders and you want to know more about it, I highly recommend exploring this website. So with all that out of the way, let's get started. Our story starts with Jim Alley. Ali was the head of marketing for Tyco Toys, and part of his job was to be up to date with all of the hot trends going on in the world of toys. That way, he could report back about it so the company could try and capitalize off of said trend. For Tyco, things were running a bit different at this point in time, because ever since the 50s, Tyco were mainly known for their toy train kits and slot cars, which was all the rage back then, but as time progressed, so did toys. And as a result, they later expanded to new newer and upgraded electric cars. But by the time the mid-80s rolled around, cars and trains were old news, and the president of the company, Richard Gray, was looking to diversify the company a bit. And he wanted something new, something different from the toy vehicles that they were mainly known for. So he assigned Jim Alley to find out what the kids found cool during those days so that they could work off of that for their next product. There was only one rule, no action figures. The 80s was the decade for action figures. G.I. Joe, Masters of the Universe, Thundercats, Star Wars, Marvel, DC, Transformers, and so many more. It was clear, the competition was tough during those days, and at the point Tycho was finally looking to diversify, they were well within the action figure craze, so getting their foot into the door at that point would have been way too difficult. So Ali had to think of something else. Christmas of 1985 would roll around, and Ali's kids would open up their presents while he stood there contemplating his next move for the company. 
Naturally, because of where he worked, Ali would use his kids, who were two boys aged 5 and 8, as reference points for what was popular among their crowd. So he looked at things from their perspective. What was something kids were interested in? Something they could never get tired of? Something they just couldn't get enough of? Then it finally dawned on him. Dinosaurs. Kids love dinosaurs. They never grew tired of them. Even Ali himself went through a dinosaur phase when he was a kid, and that didn't change with his own kids. They were at the right age for being little experts on dinosaurs, being able to pronounce their names, and probably knew more information about them than the average adult did. But dinosaurs in the toy industry was nothing new. Toy companies were well aware that kids love dinosaurs, and there were plenty of toy lines that were made to capitalize off of this interest. But Ali knew that all he had to do was give his toys some sort of gimmick to make them stand out from the rest. The question was, what would this gimmick be? From here, Ali planned it all out in his head, and the more he progressed the story, the more excited he became to tell his team about it when he would eventually go back into work. He would eventually come up with an idea for his dinosaur toy line, but it involved taking a risk, because it meant doing exactly what his boss told him not to do. In order for the dinosaur toy line to stand out, Ali thought about combining it with action figures. Doing a toy line with just dinosaurs was nothing wrong, but by combining action figures to it, there were several potential great ideas that can come of it that would surely make it stand out from the rest of the figures being sold during that point in time. So, Ali got to work in developing some kind of concept for it, eventually coming to the conclusion that in order for the toys to really be a hit with the kids, the dinosaurs had to be scientifically accurate. Kids knew more about dinosaurs than the average adult, given all of the books and documentaries they've likely read and watched about them, and would surely care about how the final product would look. So, it was imperative to Ali that the dinosaurs be as realistic as possible, and with that, that also meant the action figure figures could not be cavemen, because man and dinosaurs never coexisted with each other, and kids knew that. The action figures had to be something else, human-like, but maybe not exactly human. There could be fantastical elements too, because along with knowing dinosaurs, kids loved fantasy adventures, and combining them could be combining the two best elements kids could ask for. So long as the dinosaurs were not fantastical or stylized, the figures in the set would have to carry all of the fantastical weight so that the dinosaurs could be left alone. He would continue developing the idea, and eventually he came up with a loose story of beings coming from outer space that somehow travel back to the past to a prehistoric earth where they tame and ride dinosaurs like cowboys. And it's also here he would come up with the name as well, Dino Riders. Ali loved his idea, and he was very excited to tell his team about it, but he knew he had to be careful when it came to approaching his boss with it. He first decided to tell one of the marketing directors, Woody Brown, about the idea. Brown, like a lot of people working at Tyco at the time, was getting tired of all of the locomotives and cars and vehicles, and was also hoping for something new. That's why, when Ali came through those doors with a fresh new idea about a dinosaur alien toy line, Brown was so excited that he immediately started suggesting things to expand Ali's idea. He loved it. Slowly but surely, Ali would get the word out to the other departments at Tyco, including Mike Hurdle, the department's chief, and Lee Volpe, who was the head of design. In turn, they would tell Warren Bosch, the director of research and development, and Jack Lovewell, the mechanical designer. It seemed that no matter who Ali would tell this idea to, everyone immediately fell in love with it, and for the next month or so, all pitched in to make it happen. Lovewell was tasked to conceptualize the weapons for the aliens. At this point, it had already been decided that there was going to be two factions, one good and one evil for the story. Which is nothing new for a toy line, because a large part of why companies love these good guy, bad guy sets is because it encouraged kids to buy more of the toys, to have both the good guys and the bad guys so that they can simulate battles at home. 
so Lovewell was tasked to come up with weapon ideas for both sides. While he did that, Volpe was in charge of the story, as he assigned himself the position of chief story editor. But we'll get to the story in a bit, because the main star of the show were, of course, the dinosaurs. Bosch took on the research for the dinosaurs, which was ironic considering he was one of the few kids growing up that was never really interested in them. But as he did his job, the interest he missed out on as a kid would come right to him as an adult. Especially since this was a point in time where dinosaurs were now viewed much differently than how people initially viewed them when Bosch was a kid. Back then, they were depicted as slow, lazy, dull monsters, but after around the mid-60s, early 70s, dinosaurs were viewed as active, intelligent, colorful animals. There are actually a lot of reasons why the Tycho team decided to stick with scientific accuracy, and this was one of them. This new view on dinosaurs opened a completely new door of opportunities for how they could be translated into toys. Along with that, the team figured, should kids get bored playing with these dinosaur toys, they would then at least have great looking, high quality models of real looking dinosaurs to display. And also along with that, another reason for realistic dinosaurs was simply because they were so cool to the team. They absolutely fell in love with the scientifically accurate dinosaur and couldn't see their toy line being created in any other way. These guys were adamant on the design and refused to have their dinosaurs too cute or too stylized in any way. On January 8th of 1986, the first draft for the Dino Rider story would be written up by Bosch. The first thing to note about this draft is that instead of Dino Riders, it was titled Dino Stars Storyline, which might have been a work-in title of sorts or maybe even an alternative name that they were trying out. In this draft, the story takes place in the future of 2027. The Rulons have declared war on the Galans, which was the original name for the Valorians. The Galans lived in peace on a planet called Proterus, which orbited the star Capella in the constellation called Auriga, until of course the Rulon interfered and began threatening their very existence with a newly made bomb, or device as some call it, by the chief Rulon scientist known as Colas. The device they were planning to unleash on the Galans was intended to be released within the forces of subatomic particles to vaporize their enemies. But releasing the device had to be very delicate and precise. It was too sensitive to be released by rocket, so they opted to use their energy slash mass transporter to move their bomb right on their enemy. However, things don't go as planned, because when the Rulons load the device in and prepare to send it away, the bomb accidentally goes off as it's being transported and waves of energy encompass both the Rulons and the Galans, transporting all of them through the fabric of space and time, landing them 65 million years in the past on a planet called Earth and on it, dinosaurs still roamed the world. The battle continues between the two groups, with both sides using whatever technological materials they have left to combine them with the strengths of the nearby dinosaurs they managed to tame. What results is what's described in the draft as the most titanic battle in the history of the universe. Another draft was written on January 14th of 1986, but it's far different than the one that we just went through. For starters, the Galan were renamed to Serasians, and more specific details are given on certain elements of the story. Like it says the planet of Proterus was 45 light years away from Earth. Instead of taking place in the future of 2027, it takes place over 60 million years in the past. And along with this information, it also lists off some specific characters from the Serasian faction. The Soria Empire, which is where the story would be set in the beginning, would be ruled by King Perel and Queen Kara. And there were a couple of other characters as well named Prince Bren and Princess Talitha, along with their dinosaur friend, Three Three. Of the Rulon characters, there were only two listed, that being the Rulon King, Krulos, and the Rulon Queen, Hypatra. In this draft, the dinosaurs are actually able to talk and also live on the planet of Proterus with the Serasians. 
Legends. The dinosaurs are a respected group that hold the key to the wisdom and past of the Empire, and that wisdom and knowledge is passed down every generation through genetic memory. So the memory of the knowledge and wisdom of the Soria Empire will be inherited and secured by the next generation of dinosaur offspring. The dinosaurs also have the ability to repeat verbatim anything they hear, including normal human speech. Because of this knowledge, the dinosaurs are held in high regard, and even the king, during important matters, will seek the advice of the dinosaurs should he need it. While the Sarasians and the dinosaurs lived peacefully amongst each other, there was a group known as the Rulons that were outcasted from their civilization. And this is due to legends and stories that depicted them as grotesque and foul creatures that would steal children and force them to work in labor camps. The Rulons would wear masks to hide their faces, and legends would continue to say that no one had looked at a Rulon's face under the mask and lived to tell about it. The draft also explains that the Rulons have their own history and wisdom, but it doesn't elaborate further, but it does say that because of their history and wisdom, they had their own dinosaur as well. These stories and depictions would cause the Serasians to distrust the Rulons and outcast them to their own isolated area of the world, and one day, the Rulons grew sick of the Serasians and began to fight back. First, by targeting the dinosaurs. They did this by poisoning the water system and rivers the dinosaurs would drink from, which little by little would kill them off. One of the dinosaurs, which was initially labeled as a Triceratops but later in the draft was relabeled Dromeciomimus, was named 3-3, and was friends with Princess Talitha and Prince Bren. However, she was dying as well, as she drank from the poisoned water. But before she passes, she tells the children to take care of her three remaining eggs, for they will hold the knowledge and history of the Soria Empire that was now being threatened by the Rulons. The Rulons' plan works. Within the next few days, the dinosaurs living amongst the Sorasians are killed, and along with them, the essence of the Soria Empire. With the Rulons invading, the king gets his friends and family boarded onto a ship to escape the planet along with the three surviving dinosaur eggs. They manage to escape and spend the next several light years heading to Earth, which was the closest compatible planet for them to live on. Little did they know the Rulons were in pursuit, but the Sarasians land on Earth, which was set over 60 million years in the past, and they reestablish their civilization, where the dinosaur eggs would eventually hatch. When everything seemed to be going good, Good, the Rulons would land on Earth as well, where the battle would continue. So, like I said earlier in the video, the team wanted the dinosaurs to be scientifically accurate. This also meant with how they behaved and interacted with their surroundings. So when this draft was brought to them, I can imagine they turned it down because they weren't fans of how the dinosaurs were depicted, mainly when it comes to them being able to speak. So as a result, there were more drafts written, one of them being undated. I'm assuming it was made around the same time though, given the other drafts were also made during January of 19. 1986, but I'm not entirely sure where this one fits in the order of being created, but my guess is that it was the third one, or at least the third of the known drafts that were archived, because certain elements of the previous draft were kept in this one, but obvious things, like the dinosaurs being able to talk, were completely dropped in this one. If this was the third draft, it was also reverted back to the more simple story from the very first draft, rather than following the more specific and complicated one from the second. This draft is titled Dino Riders and the story is set in 2027 again. The human-like characters are still known as Sorasians in this one, but instead of a device accidentally transporting them and the Rulons to Earth, this draft goes about it a bit differently. After the Rulons invade their planet of Proterus, a handful of Sorasians manage to escape by ship and set their direction specifically to Earth. When they land on this distant planet, which is set 65 million years in the past, they use their remaining technology to tame the dinosaurs and rebuild their civilization. But little did the Sorasians know, the Rulons had followed them and landed on Earth as well, where they used their own devices to mind control the dinosaurs. On January 23rd of 1986, the Tycho people would make yet another draft. In this one, the setting and factions were pretty much the same, but the start of the story focused on the Sarasians orbiting environmental control ship. 
which was designed to regulate the harsh weather on their home planet, Proterus. Unfortunately for them, the Rulons managed to gain control of the ship, leaving the Seragians vulnerable. But the Seragian king, Perel, and his chief scientist, who is actually named Krulos in this version, end up discovering a new livable planet called Earth. So the surviving Seragians developed a plan to recapture the environmental control ship from the Rulons and use it to travel to Earth, which of course is set 65 million years in the past. But this is where the draft ends. I'm not entirely sure if there were more drafts written up, but the Taigo team used elements of all of these drafts and put them into a version of the Dino Rider story that would be introduced to their boss. And that was the other thing. At this point, it was a matter of presenting the idea to their boss, and the whole team was anxious about this. They all loved the idea. It was something not just new and different, but also something they all worked on together and were extremely proud of. But there was the worry in the back of their minds that their boss would immediately turn the idea down all because it was based around action figures. But at this point, Ali was confident his idea would work and just needed to be careful on how to approach Grey about it in his presentation. To prepare for their presentation, they gathered their research, rehearsed their parts, finished up the story for Dino Riders, and they even developed a little model prototype of a Deinonychus courtesy of Bosch. This Deinonychus was the first ever Dino Riders toy that was fully sculpted and painted, and I believe they pronounced it as Deinonychus because the team would nickname it Nike. At one point, when Bosch was explaining his contributions to the toy line, he stated, One of my designers was originally charged with doing the first sculpture to be used as a talking tool for our first meeting with Dick Gray. Dick was notorious for having no imagination. He had to see things in order to understand them from a creative standpoint. Sadly, my designer did such a poor job with his model, I had to scrap it and do the sculpting myself. It took at least one all-nighter, but in the morning, it looked pretty good. It certainly did the job of selling the concept to Dick. On the day of the presentation, the five main members of the initial team, Ali, Brown, Hurdle, Volp, and Bosch, went into the room and each gave their parts, which discussed the history of action figures, how children love dinosaur toys, and finally, the story of Dino Riders itself. What they would read out was one of the earlier versions of the story of the Dino Riders toy line. Far in the future, some aliens from Seragia fight for their lives against evil invaders called Rulons. The Seragians escape through a time warp with no control over where they will come out. When they emerge from their spaceship, they find themselves on Earth 65 million years ago. The planet is full of dinosaurs, and they begin to make friends with them. The evil Rulons also land there, so the Seragians have to keep fighting, and both sides utilize the dinosaurs as mounts, weapons carriers, and vehicles. The Rulons enslave the dinosaurs with brain boxes that turn them into automatons, while the Seragians work with the dinosaurs as partners and communicate with them telepathically. The Seragians, who realize they have left their planet behind forever, rename themselves Dino Riders in honor of their reptilian comrades. They'd follow this up with drawings and the little model of the Deinonychus that Bosch had made, which had been concealed under a piece of cloth this entire time and was revealed at the proper moment. They even brought up the idea of future projects with the toy line, like merchandising and licensing them for movies and books and so on. With that, they finally finished their presentation, and in his response to it, Gray smiled, stood up, applauded the group, and said, Guys, Everyone, that's goddamn sensational. They did it. The boss loved it, and the project had been greenlit. The next step was getting the toys developed in a series of stages that would require a specific budget to complete. One of these stages was designing more prototypes that would be shown off to kids in a test group to see their reactions to the future product. In the meantime, the Dino Rider's name was forbidden to say within the company. Believe it or not, espionage among these sorts of projects isn't exactly uncommon. So, to preserve their toy line and keep any one else from stealing the idea, they kept Dino Riders a secret by referring to it under a different name, BC. As they got the ball rolling for their next step, problems started to roll in as well. For starters, not everyone that helped put this idea together got to stay on board to see its development through completely. They had to get back to working in their respective departments for other Tyco products. 
Other bumps in the road included the fact that right as this project was greenlit, dinosaurs suddenly began developing a rise in popularity in the toy industry. And that's not good because that could mean heavy competition. There were points where the Tyco people would get anxious whenever there was a new dinosaur toy line from a different company, but when they'd get a closer look at those dinosaur toys, they'd notice all sorts of inaccuracies with them and would calm down because they realized their Dino Riders toys were still superior. Basically, it got to the point where any dinosaur toys that exhibited inaccuracies of any kind were not considered competition to the Tyco people. So these dinosaur toy lines weren't a huge problem. Problem. What was a huge problem though was Grey losing faith in themselves for the Dino Riders project, as he began throwing around the idea of handing the toy line off to a more experienced company and just collecting royalties from them since Tycho came up with the idea. Of course, this scared the rest of the Tycho team, because they didn't want to see their hard work handed off to another company that would likely not do nearly as good of a job as them in developing it. Luckily, Gray dropped the idea after he was convinced of this. For almost the next year, development for Dino Riders continued, including the characters, the plans for when the toys would be shipped out, the idea for a TV program, and so on. As far as the characters go, the good guys were initially named the Seragians, and they were depicted as heroic elfin aliens, while the bad guys still went by their Rulon name. The idea for the Rulons was that they were going to have multiple looks based on real-life animals, including sharks and insects. As a result, the bad guys were given amazingly original names, such as Sharky and Ant-Man. The main Rulon enemy was originally given the name of Kermit, which I think was just a work in title kind of name until they thought of something more menacing, but the reason why they chose this name was because he looked like a frog. Of course, some of these things would change after the group test with the kids, who suggested things like giving the good guys a simpler name than Seragians because many of the kids in the group were having a hard time remembering it, and having both the good guys and the bad guys be able to ride the dinosaurs. If there were going to be any good critics on toys, it would be kids, so whatever they suggested, the Tycho group were taking notes on to see what could and couldn't be changed to improve the toy's quality. As a result of the kids' suggestions, the team would end up changing the Seragian name to Valorians. Around August and September of 1986, motion was finally being made to get the TV show going as well. However, there's a whole story to that that I'll explain in its own section. For now, let's stick to the toys. Everything seemed to be going great at this point in time. Development was running smoothly, plans to reveal the Dino Riders toys at the February Toy Fair were in place, which would shortly be followed with the toys release date in April. Originally, the release was planned to be in December 1987, but was changed to an earlier date of April 1987. The team was excited. It had been almost a full year since the idea was first conceived, and for the last several months, they had worked hard to put it together. Between the arguments of scientific accuracy, the stress of potential upcoming competition, the attempt to get an on-screen version of the toy line up and running, and the effort of developing everything to their liking, they were ready to show Dino Riders off to the world. That is, until November of 1986 when they were hit with the bad news. Dino Riders would not be going to the February Toy Fair and would not be released in April. Instead, Tycho was going to go with their original plan to release the toys later in the year in December because the toy line was just not ready yet. They needed more time for the production of not just the toys but also the show, which was beginning to have its own problems. First off, the show began to worry the Tycho team due to how expensive it would be, so plans changed and the TV show was instead turned into an 8 minute videotape to be aired next to the release of the Dino Riders toys. While that was happening, a Dino Riders fan club was being set up, which made it so that when a fan submits a certain amount of proof of purchases seals, they can get access to a bunch of other Dino Riders merchandise, including collector's cards, an emblem, a membership card, and access to a newsletter that would be kept up to date by an actual paleontologist. The Tycho people would ask a couple of possible candidates for the newsletter, but the one they would end up going for was Robert Bakker, who was perfect for the job because he was the very person who would advocate for the change in public view of dinosaurs that would eventually inspire the Dino Riders toy line. 
and Bakker seemed equally excited to join the Tycho team after seeing the toys, as he was quite impressed to see the amount of care and effort that went into making them scientifically accurate. He saw this as a good way to push out this view of dinosaurs to a more mainstream audience and was all for helping out. Along with his job with the newsletter, he would also be a consultant for the Dino Riders TV show. But as much help as Bakker would provide the team, he was definitely a wild card in comparison to the rest of the Tycho people. Those of you that are familiar with Bakker will know that he's a bit of an eccentric and unapologetic figure in his field of work. But he's also passionate, and that's what people mainly love about him. Honestly though, reading about how people react to Bakker is so funny sometimes. According to the book Toyland, the high stakes game of the toy industry, which covers most of the Dino Rider story that I'm retelling for this video, it states, Bakker himself was pleased at the agreement, although once he realized how uncomfortable he made Tycho's public relations agent, he made a point of tormenting him with threats to misbehave and embarrass the company. Robert Bakker, everyone, you gotta love him. As far as the rest of the team goes, mainly with Brown and his new partner, Neil Wordy, who would join the project later on in its development, there were more presentations to give for the toys. One of these presentations was to a man named Bernard Loomis, a toy developer and marketer who was a big name in the toy industry. His contributions expanded to toys like Hot Wheels, Star Wars, Barbie, and so on. He clearly knew what he was doing, and the whole point of this presentation was to get his opinions on the Dino Riders line to see what areas might need improvement. Brown and Wordy would give their presentation, and while Loomis later admits that he didn't love the idea, he decided to help them out because they seemed so excited about it. It would actually be because of Loomis's advice why the toys would look the way they do in their final stages. Like I said earlier, there were two factions with the Dino Riders toy line. There was the Valorians and the Rulons. However, despite the differences between the two factions, all of the dinosaurs were the same for both sides. Both sides had the same type of pterosaur and ceratopsid. Loomis suggested that they should have different types of dinosaurs for each side, so that kids weren't buying two of the same dinosaurs just to get different characters, and it could help sell more toys. Of course, the problem with this was that it was already too far into development, and doing completely new species of dinosaurs would be impossible. However, they realized that there were certain dinosaur species that were different from the ones that they've already created, but the bodies and overall shape looked similar and just needed some tweaking. For example, they had already made a Monoclonius, but if they changed the head sculpt a bit, they could turn it into a Styracosaurus since the body shape was, for the most part, similar. They did this for all of the smaller and medium dinosaurs in the first series they were working on, all except for the Deinonychus, since there wasn't really a different species of dinosaurs that closely matched its body shape, so they decided to just roll with it and have two Deinonychuses in one series. Another presentation that Tycho was preparing for was the pre-toy fair. The toy fair is usually held in February, and in the previous year they had to skip it. However, in the summer of 1987, the team were planning for a pre-toy fair show that usually took place months before the actual toy fair. This was an opportunity for all of the major toy companies to show off all of their upcoming products to all of their major buyers before revealing them to the public. The plan was for Dino Riders to be shown off at this pre-toy fair show, which had plenty of its own issues as well. Brown and Wordy were assigned the job of giving the presentation, and a part of the presentation was going to be a promotional video that was being worked on by Garth Desu, who was Tycho's copywriter. The problem with this was that Tycho wanted this promotional video to basically be a standard 30 second commercial, because it was also meant to air after Christmas to promote the Dino Riders toy line for their late December release. But they also wanted Desu to incorporate an explanation of the story behind Dino Riders. They pretty much wanted a condensed version of the 8 minute videotape. Desu got Tycho to expand the time to about a minute, but that still wasn't enough. To Desu, it was too difficult to try to tell an 8 minute story in under a minute. Wait till Desu finds out what TikTok is. So Tycho decided to give Desu 2 minutes to work with. Desu would end up making something that he was proud of and he would submit it to Grey, who didn't feel the same way and had some parts of it changed, much to Desu's dismay. 
Along with this, there were also last minute changes being made to the presentation as well, which put a lot of pressure on the team because at this point, they only had a matter of days to prepare for everything to the buyers at the pre-toy fair. But through all the many obstacles, Brown and Wordy got their parts together, Desu was able to convince Gray to discard all of the changes made to his original version of the commercial, and finally, they revealed Dino Riders to the buyers and presented their pitch. And it was an absolute success. Dino Riders was sold. In fact, there was one buyer who was associated with FAO Schwartz, a huge toy brand and store, who contacted their vice president and had them meet up with Tyco to talk about the possibility of displaying the Dino Riders toys in their New York store during Christmas. Because of the time and place of these displays, it would cost the company around $50,000. But it would be great for publicity, so they took the deal and sent Brown and Wordy to oversee the installation process. This was it. This was the final stretch. At this point, it had been almost two years since the idea for Dino Riders was first conceived. But that December 1987 release date was coming up and everything was coming together. Most people they showed the toys to absolutely loved it and the team was lucky enough to be able to keep the dinosaurs the way they were. Usually in these production stories, you hear about the original version of the product that's being talked about, but after months of development and corporate corporate interference and many people either getting in the way or not being on the same page, by the end of it, the product looks so different, but not in this case. At most, you'll come to see that it was mainly the characters that went through the most changes. But the characters weren't the selling point here. It was the dinosaurs, and the fact that they were left alone and kept scientifically accurate is a blessing to the team. At this point of the story, you'd think that everything from here on would just be a complete breeze, right? No, absolutely not. One of the things that Tycho budgeted for was a bunch of set pieces to set up dioramas for the Dino Riders display in the FAO Schwartz stores. But on the morning of Christmas Day, when Brown and Wordy showed up to meet the designers for the installation, they were instead told that some of the setup had arrived in poor condition and looked terrible, and the designers were doing what they could to rebuild it. That just meant the installation for the dioramas would be delayed until later that night. And when the dioramas were eventually installed, one of the Schwartz employees asked about the windows. Brown and Wordy had no idea what they were talking about, but they eventually put it together that there was some miscommunication. See, initially, when they were first talking about displaying the Dino Riders toys in the Schwartz store, the idea of displaying them at the windows was brought up, but rejected at first. But in a different meeting with the designers, the idea was brought up again, and I guess they decided to display the toys at the windows after all. Thing is, neither Brown nor Wordy recalled this happening, and didn't oversee that the windows would get displays, because they were under the impression that all they were doing were dioramas inside the store. At this point in finding out, it was well after hours, and they only had that night to figure out displays for the windows. So what they ended up doing was that Brown and Wordy stole some of the Dino Riders toys from the shelves, along with stealing some of the display sets left over from the designers, and they just worked with what they had to display five windows around the Schwartz store. Recounting their experience during this point in time, the two felt like they did a good job with what they had, and the following day on December 26th, 1987, when the store opened, people got to see Dino Riders on display, and while it was not perfect, it was still publicity. Luckily, the designers would come back the next day and fix up the window displays a bit to make it more presentable. But what was more important was that Dino Riders, after two years of planning and development, was finally released. And it was an instant hit. In this first series, there were five Valorians and six Rulons, with Diplodocus, Taurosaurus, Triceratops, Tyrannosaurus Rex, Deinonychus, Styracosaurus, Monoclonius, Quetzalcoatlus, Pteranodon, Pterodactylus, and Ankylosaurus. After a year, this series would accumulate $35 million domestically, but with international sales, it would make a total of around $64 million. Dino Rider's success would lead to many things. In 1989, Tycho would release a second series of Dino Rider's toys that contained three new Rulons and eight Valorians, six of them being Commandos, with several new dinosaurs as well, including Brontosaurus, Kentrosaurus, Stegosaurus, Sauralophus, Edmontonia, Placerius, Dimetrodon, Struthiomimus, Pachycephalosaurus, 
Dinosaurus, and Protoceratops. In 1990, a third series and an Ice Age subseries would be released, which also contained some new dinosaurs. The third series only had three new creatures in it, including Pachyrhinosaurus, Chasmosaurus, and Quetzalcoatlus, with the Pachyrhinosaurus and Chasmosaurus being the rarest dinosaurs out of all of the series today. The final series, which was an Ice Age subseries, was released in the same year and included the Woolly Mammoth, the Giant Ground Sloth, the Sabertooth Tiger, and the Killer Warthog. Sold with the Toys was a 16-page mini-comic, which had two issues, with the first one being sold in the first series of Dino Riders toys and the second one being sold in the second, third, and Ice Age series. Along with this, they would also sell Dino Riders merchandise, Tycho had licensed Dino Riders to Marvel Entertainment, where they would produce a comic adaptation, and the 8-minute videotape would also get picked up for a weekly Saturday morning cartoon. But that's not all. Dino Riders would even get the attention of the Smithsonian Museum, who were so impressed with the scientific accuracy of the dinosaur models, that they would endorse the toy line and even reissued the dinosaurs without the armor, weapons, and action figures, and released them under the name of Dinosaurs and Other Prehistoric Reptiles Collection. And a little bit later in the early 90s, Tycho would take on another dinosaur-related toy line from a pre-existing IP called Cadillacs and Dinosaurs, where they would reuse some of their models from Dino Riders, more specifically the Kentrosaurus, the Triceratops, the Deinonychus, and the Quetzalcoatlus. And along with that, like anything else that gains a massive amount of popularity, there were plenty of knockoff toys that copied the Dino Rider style as well. Some were a little bit more loose in their similarities with the Dino Riders toys, while others were blatant copies of it. Regardless of what toys fell into either of these groups, one thing was for certain. They were both cheap as hell. Suffice to say though, the Dino Riders toys were an absolute success. But what about the show? So, let's go all the way back to August of 1986. It was always part of the plan to have some kind of program air next to the release of the Dino Riders toy line as a way to promote the product. This wasn't at all a new practice in the toy industry. A lot of cartoon TV shows in the 80s were basically commercials for the toys that were released next to them. To the point where most toy companies found it necessary to do in order for their toys to be a success. Tyco was no different, but the ball for the TV show didn't really get rolling until around August or September of 1986. A big part of it was because the toys were the main focus of Tycho's time, but it was also a matter of the Tycho team just not knowing where to even begin with the show. They were toy developers after all, not show producers. By September, however, Bob Laurie, Tycho's vice president of advertising, threw a name out there, that being Jay Garfinkel. Laurie seemed to have known Garfinkel, who had prior experience as a producer in the TV industry and seemed like a good candidate for helping out with the Dino Riders TV show to coincide with the release of the toy line. But when Lori first tried to reach out to him, he turned them down, but was convinced to join for lunch to at least hear the idea out. Hear the idea out is a bit of an overstatement because Lori and Brown, who was also invited to this lunch meeting, said one word to Garfinkel dinosaurs, and he was sold. According to the Toyland book that I mentioned earlier, Garfinkel later admitted, it is the dream of every producer and writer who loves dinosaurs to be able to work on a dinosaur show. That way he can use his ideas, tell his stories, and pose his own fantasies on those primordial beings. I knew I would have my pick of writers because so many of them would love the work. Dinosaurs lived, they are not like unicorns or other imaginary creatures. To be able to tell your own story of what really happened to these creatures who really lived is a science fiction writer's dream. There was a problem though. The cost for a TV show seemed beyond what Tycho was willing to spend on it. But at the same time, the team felt like they needed some sort of on-screen format to help properly explain the story of their toy line. So the decision was made to meet in the middle. Instead of a full-on TV program, Garfinkel would be given $200,000 by Tycho to just make an 8-minute videotape about Dino Riders that would explain the characters and lore and would be aired next to the toy's release date. And from there, they could see if they could sell it as a possible series. 
Should that plan fail, they figured they could just sell the tape in stores to make something back from it. Garfinkel would then bring Paul Kirchner on board, a freelance artist and writer who's had a varied career, illustrating for many different comics and magazines of popular IPs like G.I. Joe, GoBots, He-Man, and so on. Kirchner would write up drafts of what the toy developers wanted for their show, which was very clear. As far as the characters go, they were willing to be flexible and make whatever changes needed to be made with them, but one thing that they didn't want the TV people to do was mess with their dinosaurs. The dinosaurs were to be kept as realistic as possible, meaning they couldn't be overstylized or too cute, much like the rules they set for themselves when developing the toys. One idea for the human-like characters that was thrown out there by Jim Alley was making the Valorians warrior elves, as he was inspired from his interest in J.R.R. Tolkien books, but Garfinkel had different ideas for the characters and was against Ali's suggestion. According to Garfinkel, he said, I don't believe in stereotypes, but this is not a heroic character. There are certain idiomatic expressions, visual as well as verbal. In film, for example, a dissolve usually means time is passing. And there are some idioms in looks. A strong heroic character is typically a blonde Aryan type. You have very little time to tell your story, and you don't have time to get bogged down. You can't deal with a short, dark character as a hero without taking more time to set it up. But Kirchner was a bit different. He seemed to want to keep the peace between themselves and the toy developers, and did his best to include everyone's ideas in the first draft, which he finally finished right before Christmas of 1986. In the first draft, there were a lot of noticeable differences with the characters from how they would eventually be portrayed in the final version. In this early draft, the Valorians looked like Norman Conquerors and had a different set of names. The main character was named Arterus and was the scientific genius that led the group. Followed by him, there was Iron Oak, who seemed to be the bronze of the group, being described as the armorer, quartermaster, and sergeant major. Then there's Elkin, who was the gentle, innocent soul who wants to fight but isn't always able to. After him, there's Mind's Eye, the wise old man who is also blind. And finally, there was Serena, whose main ability was her healing powers. There was also a difference with the Rulons. In the original draft, the main leader was named Mog, who ruled by making those that follow him fear him. And his troops consisted of three different groups. The Sharkers, the Cobra Warriors, and the Ant-Men. The Sharkers were led by Hammerhead, the strongest of the groups. The Cobra Warriors were led by Fangthorn, who's described to be sly and conspiratorial. And finally, the Ant-Men were led by Antor, who's not very smart, but is devoted to his leader. As far as the dinosaurs go, as requested by the toy developers, they were left alone, with the only things noted on the draft were the nicknames that were given to them. Terry the Pterodactyl, Don the Pteranodon, Clone the Monoclonius, Top the Triceratops, Doc the Diplodocus, and finally Tyrant the Tyrannosaurus Rex. Garfinkel wasn't a huge fan of this draft. He thought the names of the characters should be more memorable and suggested for them to have more personality and maybe even be task-oriented. Another big issue he had were with the dinosaurs and how they would communicate and bond with not just the characters in the show, but also the audience watching the show. He felt like there needed to be more to the dinosaurs, maybe some more personality for the audience to really connect with. And to do this, they needed to speak. He knew this suggestion wouldn't be taken lightly by everyone else, so he attempted to meet in the middle a bit by suggesting that the dinosaurs that are free could have personalities, while the ones that were enslaved to the Rulon's brain boxes could act more animalistic and feral, only responding with grunts and roars rather than actual speech. Around after Christmas of 1986, about a year after the idea was conceived by Ali, the team met up together to discuss their differences with the first draft. As expected, the toy developers were all pretty much against the dinosaur speaking, especially Brown. But eventually, Garfinkel was able to convince everyone to at least try it out in a second draft. Everyone at first, except Brown, who held out the longest, but even he eventually gave in to see how it would turn out. Some days later, on 
on January 5th, 1987, Kirchner would finish the second draft, and to the toy developers, it was atrocious. What started out as realistic dinosaurs were now nothing but cartoon characters. Among the new set of dinosaur characters featured, there was Gimlet the Pterodactyl, whose personality is that they complain, try to give advice, and is condescending when he ends up being right. There was also Sarge the Monoclonius, who was grumpy, boring, and not very talkative. There was Rover the Deinonychus, who's fast and overconfident, to the point where his cockiness gets him in trouble at times. There was Big Bertha, who was a Diplodocus that's described as fussy, opinionated, and fiercely maternal. There was Slip, the baby Diplodocus, who was lovable, clumsy, gets into trouble every now and again, has a puppy dog nature to him, and served as the humorous dinosaur character. And finally, there was Spitfire, the Pteranodon, who was tough and showed a lack of emotions because of it. The team hated it. They hated everything about these characters. They ordered Kirchner to go back to do a third draft where he was to take out the names, take out the talking, and leave the dinosaurs completely alone. Kirchner would come back on January 18th with the third draft. The biggest change were the dinosaurs, as they were reverted back to their original realistic states. As far as the alien characters go, there were some minor changes. In the last draft, they had actually renamed Arteris's character to Magnus, but in this next one, they would change it to Queststar. Same thing with Mog. In the last draft, he was given the name Carnage, but in this next one that Kirchner was making, it would be changed to Krulos. Along with these changes, a couple of characters would also get assigned some ages. Questar was 25, while Serena was 17, and is described as mature for her age. And the Rulons in general were made to be more vicious. The show was getting there, but Kirchner was sent to do one final draft after more changes were made to the characters. Someone had suggested for the characters to use a device called AMPS to communicate with the dinosaurs, which stand for Amplified Mental Projector. They also suggested upping Serena's age to 23 in case a love interest plotline with Questar was to come up in the later developments for the show. Along with that, the rest of the characters were made to be less complex and more formulaic, leading to the ones that we have now. By the end of it, most of what the Tycho team had came up with in regards to the characters and themes had pretty much all been changed. But the dinosaurs were left alone, and that's all that mattered. So with that, Garfinkel continued his work on the videotape for the following months, and when the Dino Riders toy line was finally released, so was his 8 minute promotional tape. And eventually, because because of the toy's success, the videotape would get picked up to be turned into a Saturday morning cartoon show. For the following months, the show would be in production, with the South Korean-based animation studio Han Ho Hyung Up working on the animation for the first two episodes, before being replaced by another South Korean studio called ACOM, short for Animation Korean Movie Production. Why this change was made, I don't really know. But it would explain why the show lacks a bit of consistency with its art style within the first few episodes. Then there was another animation studio called Island Animation that came in to work on the final episode, which was actually the Dino Rider special called Dino Riders in the Ice Age. As mentioned earlier, the Dino Riders project had some consultants, one of them being paleontologist Robert Bacher, who was considered to help run the newsletter for the Dino Riders fan club, but was also brought on to help out with the show as well, to keep it as realistic as the toy developers wanted it. But again, there were problems with people just not being on the same page, which led to conflict. For example, there was a point where the producers wanted a brontosaurus in their show, probably because it was not only a recognizable dinosaur, but also a recognizable name. But Bakker tried to explain to them that brontosaurus was just not a name that scientists use very often at that point in time, so it was better to use a different name, but they didn't listen. It wasn't the first time the team ignored Bakker's advice. Bakker soon grew tired of this, and after he tried giving his advice again, Again, this time regarding the Stegosaurus and Pachycephalosaurus, he was told that the dinosaurs would remain unchanged, which would cause him to leave the project. 
According to a book called Dinosaur Collectibles that talks about dinosaur toy lines in depth like Dino Riders, Bakker stated, The Dino Riders were the best action dinosaurs ever made. Tycho used some really good artists. A couple of favorites of mine were Pachycephalosaurus and Struthiomimus. The line was aimed at kids, but many of my adult colleagues wanted to swipe some of the toys I kept in my office. I designed the Stegosaurus, and everyone liked it, except for one marketing publicity guy. He wanted to change the spikes to a massive size, bow out the legs, give it too many plates on its back, basically make it appear as Stegosaurus appeared back in the old movies in the 1920s. I couldn't have my name associated with this design and soon left the project. And this wasn't the only person whose advice the show produced would ignore. Fantasy artist and dinosaur enthusiast William Stout was also brought on board as the show's advisor. But according to his words, it was the classic situation. The producers always want a voice of authority for kids shows, someone they can point to as an expert giving the show validity. I got the job, but soon discovered it was a token position. I got credit for the show, but really didn't have much to do with what was used. I redrew a few sheets they submitted, and I would suggest things like, this animal can't do what you're suggesting, but here's one that can. They always thanked me and seemed to be taking my advice, but in the end, they never changed a thing. But not everyone had this sentiment working on Dino Riders. Donald Glute, who's seemingly done everything under the sun when it comes to creating media, was brought onto the show as a writer, and according to what he had to say about his experience on Dino Riders, he states, It was very easy to write, and I could often write a complete episode in a day. We intentionally showed the toy products a lot in the cartoon. We would have the characters do outrageous things like having the Pachycephalosaurus bang its head against a rock to cause an earthquake. But finally, through all of the obstacles, the show would finally air on October 1st, 1988. There would be a total of 14 episodes that were not only produced by Marvel Productions, but also featured on Marvel Action Universe, which was a syndicated block program on TV that featured a couple of other animated shows as well. The episodes of Dino Riders were nothing too different from the usual 80s cartoon shows you'd see. The show starts off pretty strong with the first episode throwing you right into to the action with the Valorians flying through space, attempting to get away from the dreadful Rulons. In an attempt to escape their enemies, the Valorians used their step device, short for space-time energy projection, right as the Rulons lock onto the Valorian ship with their tractor beam. This backfires on the Rulons because the tractor beam ends up giving the step all of the energy it needs to function, but right as they disengage the tractor beam, the two ships are thrown through the fabric of space and time, sending them to crash land on a prehistoric Earth. Not being able to go back, the Valorians, led by Questar, see Earth as their new home and they use their Amps device to befriend the dinosaurs. The Rulons, led by Krulos, don't feel the same way and want to go back to their own time and place to continue invading and taking over galaxies. In order to do that, they need the Step Crystal from the Valorian ship. So Krulos and his troops gather nearby dinosaurs and put brain boxes on them, which mind controls the dinosaurs and forces them into war. From here on, the show is just about the Rulons coming back time and time again to battle the Valorians for the Step Crystal, with both sides using their own dinosaurs with laser guns mounted onto them to fight against each other. As far as all of the Valorian characters go in the final product of the show, there's the fearless leader of the Valorians, Questar, the blind but wise old man Mind's Eye who is the grandfather of Serena, there's Serena who's kept her ability to heal, there's Young Star who's cocky, competitive, but good-hearted and has good intentions, even if he is a bit misguided sometimes. There's Gunner, the tough war veteran who trains the rest of the Valorians. There's Turret, the team scientist and technician. And then there's Lad, the youngest of the group, but is very eager and always wanting to help, though is often too inexperienced or unprepared to. In regards to the Rulon characters, there's the main enemy Krulos who rules over the Rulon Empire and wants to use the powers of the Valorians for his own evil deeds. There's Rasp, the snake leader of the Viper group, Hammerhead, the leader of the Sharkmen, and Antor, the leader of the Antmen. 
When it comes to Rasp and Hammerhead, they usually are fighting over who has the higher position among the Rulons, especially since that higher position would be next in charge should anything happen to Krulos, while Antor just serves as one of Krulos' generals and follows his every command. There are other characters, but these just make up the main cast. Each episode goes through a different lesson and sometimes features something different story-wise, like for example the Thanksgiving episode going over the Valorian's origin before they had to escape the Rulons, and the episode that ends on a cliffhanger that reveals Questar was secretly working with Krulos and his leadership is being questioned. And then there's an episode and special that actually strays away from the main cast of characters and actually focuses on the Commandos, which make up the special military force among the Valorians that, in this specific episode, have to rescue a bunch of stolen Triceratops eggs after they're stolen by the Rulons who want to incubate and use them to build a bigger army of dinosaurs. The commando team are made up of six members, Astra, the war veteran and former teacher on Valoria who is now the leader of the commandos, Glide, who typically uses a glider to cover the group from the skies during battle, Bomba, the guy who handles the explosives, FaZe, who's just described as an artillery expert, Rock, who scouts the terrain for the group and is an expert climber, and Chameleon, who often camouflages himself to spy on the enemies. In the Ice Age special, which is also the final episode of the whole series, the Commandos use the newly invented time machine to try and temporarily get themselves away from a Rulon ambush, but accidentally send themselves into the future in the time of the Ice Age, where they run into some prehistoric mammals and a tribe of cavemen being attacked by a Neanderthal tribe ruled by their ruthless leader, Grom. But aside from these episodes, the show just sticks to the same formula of the Rulons going after the Valorians to get the Step Crystal, having a huge laser gun shootout with them before the Valorians inevitably win the battle, send the Rulons running with Krulos always saying that he'll be back. It's a pretty repetitive show, but that's to be expected because really, each episode was mainly meant to show off the different dinosaurs that were based on the toys, and since the main gimmick of said toys were dinosaurs with lasers and armor fighting aliens, that's what we should expect to see a lot in the show as well. And this was even more obvious because each episode focused on a different dinosaur that was a part of the toy line. One episode would be focused on just the flying pterosaurs, while another was focused on just the ceratopsids. And even in one of the final episodes, the main focus was on the Brontosaurus, which was one of, if not the largest set in the Dino Riders toy line. And of course, going back to the repetitiveness of the show, another reason for it was to be able to repeatedly feature the main stars of the toy line, that being the Tyrannosaurus Rex and the Diplodocus. Along with some of the smaller sets as well, but aside from the Brontosaurus, these two guys were the next largest set, and likely the ones that every kid wanted the most. As far as the show's reception goes, it seems to have been remembered pretty well for the most part. I mean, let's be honest. A show about dinosaurs suited with armor and laser laser guns fighting off aliens and other dinosaurs with armor and laser guns sounds pretty cool and it's unsurprising that most people fell in love with it, not just for the toy line, but also for the TV show as well. Sure, it's not exactly a show with a lot of depth and contains a lot of generic elements that makes for a standard 80s cartoon, but it was never trying to be anything more than that. It was just trying to deliver on a lot of action to advertise its products and people seem to have loved it for what it was. Personally for me, I didn't mind the show and did have fun watching it, at least at the start. I was kinda over all of the laser fights and 80s one-liners by the time I got to the final episodes. I just kinda got bored with the show, I felt like it got pretty repetitive, save for a few moments here and there. I think my biggest gripe with the show is that the dinosaur designs are very mixed. One minute they'll look fine, but the next they'll look completely awful. Seriously, some of these dinosaurs just look so weird for no reason. I don't know, I feel like they could have done a better job translating the dinosaurs to 2D animation, but aside from those little critiques, the show overall wasn't too bad. But the show wasn't the only adaptation for Dino Riders. There were also the comics. So 
So there were actually two different comics made for Dino Riders. There was the mini comic and then there was the Marvel comics. The mini comics weren't anything too special. They came with the toys, they were only 16 pages long, and they only lasted two issues. These mini comics pretty much went through the same story that would later be used in the TV show. The Valorians are flying through space trying to escape the Rulons. Both get sucked into a portal caused by the step that transport them to a different time and place where they both crash land on a prehistoric Earth. Questar and his people befriend the dinosaurs with their amps, while Krulos and his troops brainbox them to use them as nothing more than weapons. They battle each other, the Valorians win, and give themselves the new name of Dino Riders in honor of their new Saurian companions. In the second issue, the Valorians rescue a trapped Sauralophus before they're ambushed by the Rulons, who manage to capture Serena. With Serena imprisoned, the rest of the Valorians come up with a plan to save her by infiltrating the Rulon camp with their dinosaurs and breaking her out, along with all of Krulos's other imprisoned dinosaurs causing a stampede within his compound. Serena is saved, the Rulons are chased off once again, and the mini-comic ends on a happy note. Very simple story, which is to be expected since it was just another way for the toy developers to get their story about the Valorians and Rulons across to the children who would buy the toys. Actually, now that I think of it, there were technically three different types of comic adaptations to the story. There there was also the manga style comic that was released for the Japanese versions of the Dino Riders toys as well. The Dino Riders toys were sold internationally, but for the most part, at least from what I can see, the packaging of the toys were all the same from everywhere it was sold, all except Japan. The standard Dino Riders packaging had art of the dinosaurs printed onto the box cover, but for the Japanese versions of the toys, it just featured printed images of the toys themselves on the box cover instead. Along with that, the boxes were given labels as well, with the Valorians and the Rulons having their own unique symbols. And like all of the other regions the toys were sold in, the Japanese toys also came with a mini comic booklet as well, but this one featured it in an art style more akin to what's seen in mangas, which was probably much more exaggerated than what the original toy developers would have wanted, but given where it's coming from, it's not too surprising to see. I won't bore you with the details of the story because it's just the same standard story that I feel like I've retold like 10 times already. And we're still not done because this wasn't the only comic that was made about Dino Riders. As I mentioned earlier, Dino Riders featured on Marvel Action Universe with various other shows. It was not uncommon for Marvel to make comic tie-ins for some of those shows, and Dino Riders was one of them. As a result, a three-issue comic was produced, which took the biggest departure from what Dino Riders was originally made meant to be. While the toy line and TV show were supposed to tell a simple, kid-friendly story about two races of aliens battling each other with dinosaurs fitted with battle gear and laser guns, the comics also do that, but with it, they take the story in a different direction that has darker and weirder elements to it. There's more conflicts between the characters that make them more complicated and gives them more layers than they had in the show. It was written by comic book editor George Carrick and illustrated by comic book artists Kelly Jones and Danny Bolinati. According to the 72nd issue of the Marvel Age magazine, Caragon was pretty much given complete freedom to make the comic however he wanted. So he did, and I guess the Marvel comics were actually being made before the show because at one point during the article it says, the Tycho people were so impressed with what George had created that they ordered changes in the animated series to conform with what was going to appear in the comic. That being said, the two formats are not entirely identical. While both follow a similar story, they both take a different direction with it. And like I said earlier, the comic gets a bit weird. In February of 1989, the first issue called The Path would be released, and it starts off in the Valorian's home planet, Valoria, where the planet is unfortunately dying from the heavy battles that they've had with the Rulons. So Questar loads up the surviving Valorian onto a ship to escape. 
While that's happening, we're introduced to a character by the name of Tark, who is actually Questar's half-brother. Tark questions his brother's leadership and is also in this kind of sort of love triangle between himself, Serena, and Questar. Apparently, Tark and Serena were supposed to marry at one point, but called it off after he left her for the path, which is what they called their ability to telepathically communicate with each other. Soon, the Valorians are off into space with the Rulons after them, so Questar orders to have the step open up a hole in the fabric of dimensional space to escape their enemies. But they're locked on with a tractor beam and drag the Rulons through the hole with them to a new time and place. The two ships crash down on what turns out to be a prehistoric earth inhabited by dinosaurs. The Valorians call this place their new home and befriend the dinosaurs, while the Rulons brainbox the dinosaurs so that they can build an army to fight against the Valorians and steal the step crystal to get back to their own time and place. With the Rulons also on Earth with them, the Valorians decide to use their new dinosaur companions to help them fight against their enemies. And for the first time in this entire series, there's actually a part where Questar questions the ethics behind this. They're the ones who crash landed on the dinosaur's planet, and on top of this, they're planning to use them as weapons. But Serena insists that the dinosaurs are not their slaves, but their friends who want to help them. But Questar still doesn't feel right about it. It's brief, but it's actually kind of nice to see them talking about something like this. It's more of a taboo subject in the context of a kid's show, since, you know, it's supposed to be kid-friendly and not that deep. But it's cool to at least see them acknowledge the ethical issue behind it, despite their intentions. Of course, though, this is a short comic, so it's not explored that much. Another difference with this comic from its source material are the characters. The comic has all of the other characters that we already know, including Questar, Serena, Mind's Eye, Youngstar, Gunner, Lad. But they also have new characters like Ares and Magnus, who are Tark's associates. There's Pandora, who's Ares' wife. Lad has an older sister in this one named Cass, who also serves as Young Star's love interest. Not all of these characters are actually new. Some of them, like Tark and Ares, do feature in the TV show, but play different roles than they do here. All of these characters play minor roles in the comics, but they do exist. For Tark, who plays a bigger role among these minor characters, questions Questar's leadership throughout the story. At one point even, during the battle with the Rulons, Questar leads Krulos away from the group and towards a cliff, with Tark chasing after them. Tark sees this as an opportunity to execute Questar and take his place as the leader, so he tries to sneak up on him. Meanwhile, Questar loses Krulos and is standing over the cliff before he senses danger behind him. Thinking it's Krulos, Questar shoots his laser gun at Tark, knocking him off the cliff to his presumed death. As he did this, Magnus and Gunner show up to see the whole thing happen, but from their perspective, it looked like Questar murdered his own brother. So he's arrested, and in a weird turn of events for a comic based off an action-based TV show, the next issue actually focuses on Questar on trial for the murder of his brother Tark. Questar obviously pleads not guilty on the grounds of self-defense, but the three judges, who are Mind's Eye, Serena, and Ares, hear out the witnesses Magnus and Gunner. Ares and Magnus, being associates of Tark, also don't see Questar as a strong leader and want to see him removed of his position. However, Mind's Eye and Serena approach the trial more fairly. They end up judging his innocence based on what they could find through a mind probe, which basically means the judges are going to use the path to see Questar's inner thoughts. But due to his mental strength, they aren't able to get a satisfactory answer. So in following the law of innocent until proven guilty, it's decided that Questar is acquitted and he is still the leader of the Valorians. In the third and final issue, the comic focuses on Tark's story after he's shot by Questar. And things take a very weird turn with this part. Tark fell off the cliff and down into the jungle. His landing would end up breaking several of his bones and knocking him out. But when he awakes, he realizes that the Rulons have captured him. Instead of killing him, Krulos thinks Tark may be of use to them. So he puts Rasp in charge of fixing him up and seeing what he can do. Rasp runs some tests and sees that Valorian DNA is easy to mutate, and intends to combine Tark's genes with dinosaur genes to use against Krulos and the other Valorians. That way he can become the new leader of the Rulons. 
Ras fuses the two genes together, which ends up turning Tark into a dinosaur-human hybrid. It's so weird to see this concept being played out for a comic based on a, a kid's TV show. But yeah, th this comic features a dinosaur-human hybrid. Anyways, this backfires on Rasp, because Tark is now insanely strong and fast from the dinosaur DNA, and he uses his new abilities to escape the Rulon compound. Rulons, laser guns, not even the dinosaur can stop Tark. At one point during the fight, he literally grabs a charging Stegosaurus by the tail and swings it at the Rulon ship. Tark is able to escape the compound and befriends a couple of Triceratops young, whose mother had died from a battle with the T-Rex, the same T-Rex that the Rulons had captured. Nearby, Tark finds the Rulons going after Questar and a couple of other Valorians who were out on an expedition, one of them being Serena. When Serena is shot by one of the Rulons, Tark hurls a boulder at the T-Rex's head, dislodging its brain box. The T-Rex goes after the Rulons, and Serena recovers from the blast. She and Questar are safe, but the Triceratops young are being attacked by the T-Rex once again, so Tark goes to their rescue. He fights off the T-Rex and is able to hit it off the cliff, and when he recovers, he finds himself surrounded by several grateful dinosaurs. Tark realizes that since he had beaten the T-Rex, the king of the dinosaurs, he now holds and embraces that title. And no joke, that's just how the comic ends. It's a very weird contrast from the show, but it does do some things in it that I actually kind of enjoyed. I liked how the characters had some more layers to them, and some of the conflict they go through did make things a bit more interesting. Overall, it was a very strange version of Dino Riders, and the direction they decided to take it in, especially in that final issue, was completely unexpected for me. The third issue doesn't even really feel like a Dino Rider story. I mean, the concept is already crazy enough with weaponized dinosaurs with armor and laser guns. A dinosaur-human hybrid plot to end it off with seemed kind of unnecessary. Regardless, it was pretty cool to see, I just feel like it could have been its own story and not attached to Dino Riders, but that's just me. Well, that was it. That was all of the Dino Riders content that was made, all of which took place between the late 80s and early 90s. Since then, not much has happened with Dino Riders. However, Tygo Toys would continue to expand and diversify with toys until March of 1997, when the company would merge with another big toy company called Mattel, who now owns the rights to Dino Riders, but seemed to have no real interest in doing anything with the IP. That was until around 2015. On October 12th of that year, it was exclusively announced on a site called The Tracking Board that Mattel had expressed interest in a possible live-action Dino Riders film adaptation. In fact, it was announced that they were in the early stages of development. Apparently, Mattel was partnering with producers from a company called Solipsis Film, and that the movie was going to be made to compete against Hasbro's Transformers franchise, which is what they were focusing on at the time, it seems. Some sources also state that the film was going to be aimed at a more family-friendly audience with a strong action-adventure storyline. Naturally, this news had many people hyped not just for another dinosaur film, but a live-action film about dino riders. At the time, Mattel was still looking for writers and a studio to secure the movie. And this is pretty much all that's known about the film adaptation. There was never a follow-up to the news from Mattel, not even to announce that the movie had been cancelled. Why the movie was never made, I I don't really know. My first thought was that maybe it had something to do with Jurassic World, which had released earlier that year, and the fact that it was to be continued with more sequels. It's possible that whatever studios Mattel was seeking to help them with their movie saw this as tough competition and didn't want to take that risk. So they turned down the Dino Riders movie before Mattel eventually canned the idea entirely. Of course, that's just a guess. There could have been many factors as to why this movie was never made made, but many people still hold out hope that maybe one day it will. I can imagine that hope was held out even longer after 2021 rolled around. Because for the first time in over three decades, a Dino Riders set was released called the Rulon Warriors Battle Pack. But this wasn't like the 80s toys. This was a single one-off set of miniature toys that was initially sold exclusively through an online retailer called Entertainment Earth. 
The set contained various Rulon and Valorian characters and different dinosaur species from the show that were divided by two solid colors, purple and green. And from what I can gather, this seemed more like a Rush toy set that disappointed many in the Dino Riders fan base, because these toys paled in comparison to the late 80s versions. That being said, seeing this toy set come completely out of nowhere probably got some people hyped up for a possible Dino Riders return. Of course, that was back in 2021, and nothing has been released or announced since. Along with that, given Mattel's current commitment to the Jurassic World franchise, and their role in making all of their toys even to this day, I don't have high hopes that Mattel is going to bring back anything Dino Riders related anytime soon. That being said, the toys, the show, even the comics have left an impact on people. Because even after being inactive for over 30 years at this point, with the exception of a random one-off toy set, Dino Riders still remains close to many people and in that right it's still going strong. There are hardcore collectors out there that are probably still heavily dedicated in collecting as much Dino Rider stuff as possible. There's also plenty of examples of people creating their own custom toys based on Dino Riders, with my personal favorite being the Lego Mox sets with the dinosaurs from the Dino Defense HQ series. Those look really cool. And along with all of this, there was even a fan-made Dino Riders video game made on PC at one point. It was made on a program called 3D Game maker and ran on another program called Dark Basic. And while the game was made to be played completely for free for the fans of the Dino Riders franchise, the game can only run on Windows XP and earlier. But the game had everything. It had multiple stages, with each one in a different location featured in the Dino Riders story, like the Valorian base, the Dreadlock, which is the name of the Rulon ship, the Rulon's territory, and even a couple of the Ice Age levels. There's a total of nine levels, with each one having various Rulon enemies like the Vipers, the Shark the Gator Men, and each level also features a boss battle with different prehistoric animals like Deinonychus, the Killer Warthog, and the Tyrannosaurus Rex, and different Rulon enemies like Antor, Croc, and Krulos himself. I haven't attempted to play this game myself, but the Dino Riders World website does offer the list of requirements needed in order to work it, and they provide some download links as well, if you want to give it a try yourselves. Honestly, considering how far video games have progressed in the industry since the late 80s, I'm really surprised that an official Dino Riders video game was never made. Anyways, aside from all of that, this all just goes to show just how dedicated the Dino Riders fanbase is when it it comes to their love for this franchise and their desire to keep it alive. Even after over three decades of inactivity, there's still people, in my comments section even, that talk about how cool it would be if Dino Riders made some kind of comeback. Who knows, maybe one day, even if it's a long time from now, we'll see some sort of on-screen adaptation of it, or maybe even a return in the toy industry. But for now, we at least have these other forms of media to remember it by. Thank you all so much for watching, and please, have a nice day.